Good afternoon or good evening or good morning if you're listening or watching on Catch Up and welcome to Tech Bugs and Rock and Roll episode 10. We've decided to use episode numbers. Yes. It's a, a weekly live recording and podcast with me, Dylan BT. And me, Mark Rendell, where we talk about anything that it occurs to us to talk about and things that we've seen during the week that we think might be interesting. You decide. So uh, this week we've been, uh, it, it's been an entertaining week. So my favorite thing I discovered this week, um, I have a keyboard, uh, which I, we've talked about on the show before. I have a Keychron Q5 NVA something mechanical oh, that's keyboard. One of those which, ones uh, with all the swappable keycaps and switches. Which, and Yeah, I'm a, did stuff. you ever read, there was a, an old article, maybe 20 years ago now, by uh, Neil Stevenson. The, the mm. author who wrote Snow Crash and the yes. Diamond Age and Cryptonomicon, he wrote a, a, a sort of long-form essay called In the Beginning Was the Command Line, Yes, where he talks about uh, operating systems. And uh, he has this, this vivid analogy that I always remember. He says, you know, imagine that you're, you're going to the operating system shop and... Uh, there's there's a place that sells designer sports cars, which is clearly like Apple Mac OS. And there's a place that sells kind of mediocre pickup trucks. And there's a place across the street that sells Batmobiles, and they're really expensive. And that was BIOS, if anyone remembers BIOS. BIOS was I remember brilliant. BIOS. Um, it's haiku. And uh, hey, Danny Katzman making it live. Welcome to the stream, Dan. Danny. So, um, and he says, yeah, and on the, the other corner, there are people giving away tanks for free. And that's Linux. <laughs> And it's yes. like, it's a do-it-yourself tank, and anyone can build your own tank and all this kind of stuff. Um, but he talks in that uh, in that essay about something called the hole hog, which is a drill, like a thing for making holes in walls oh, made by the, yes. the Milwaukee Tool Company, which is a, a cube with a gearbox and an engine and a bit of pipe. <laughs> and he says, if you grew up on the hole hog, then, you know, most modern plastic drills with their ergonomic think grips, you wouldn't recognize them as tools at all. You'd think they were a toy. And uh, to come circling gracefully back to where we started, the Keychron mechanical keyboard is a bit like the whole hog. It's a slab of steel with uh, 95 or 104 mechanical switches on it, and you can change just about everything on it and reprogram it. Um, but one of the keys it has is a, a little key with a microphone on it that um, was not a requirement when I when I bought the keyboard. Good morning, Origami Marie. Welcome to the stream. Um, but uh, the default mapping for this key is Cortana. And so if you're That's typing away and you reach to press home and you reach a little bit too far, it pops up a window which is supposed to run Cortana, which uh, now, now I don't understand because Cortana was like it was a fictional character in the game Halo. Is that That's, right? That is correct. It was a hologram yes. in the game Halo, which the chief character, Master Chief, mm. um, I assume his last name was character. Uh, I assumed his last name was Chief, and he was like eight years old, and that's why he's Master Chief. And when he I grows up, he'll be Mister Chief, and then um, his son will be Mister Chief the Second. No, but no, I, I don't think no, no. His, his <laughs> name is is Master Chief character because it's like Master. Yeah, it's his first name. His, his, his surname is definitely character. Anyway, uh, yes, it's a hologram, but that doesn't stop them having a weird sort of will they won't they thing over the course of three games it's it's very strange oh character development oh yes. Um, so so bugdan's just popped up in the comments and said hello happy pi day yes um, it is pi it day is, we it didn't is three, catch 3.14 well or it's a, pi day if you write the date in an american format which or in an iso didn't. format yeah, yeah, 2024, yeah. 314, 224. Yeah. And I was actually trying to work out today, at what point in the day does the digits on an ISO formatted date time, what it, when is the closest approximation to pi? And so 3.14, then you got 159. And there isn't really like, like one o'clock isn't one, it's 01. And pi is 3.141, not 1401. So I think probably 314 at... So it would be one six. So so four p.m. So the time that this show kicked off today is the closest numerical approximation to pi that you will get on an ISO date stamp if you ignore <laughs> the year part. So uh, I so thought that was in, nice. In one thousand one hundred and seventeen years, though, I'll be dead. Um, we will be dead. <laughs> but on the ninth, uh, no, on the twenty sixth. 
what are we doing? You're, are uh, you trying to work out when the date nine. will be pi? <laughs> yeah, basically, it'll be 3,141, and then May the 9th uh, at 2.06. What Mark is currently seconds. trying to do in his head is the equivalent of typing 3141592653 into JavaScript's new date.parse constructor. Yes. But because he's doing it in his head, uh, he's ca- like concentrating he's quite hard, <laughs> which you can't see if you're listening to the podcast, but his brow is intensely furrowed right now. Yes. So anyway, yeah, yes, it's it Pi is. Day, which is which We is have two Daniels fun. in the chat, we, 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 Daniel yeah, Mello and Day. Two Daniels. Uh, so if you're yeah. uh, listening on your podcast and taking the dog for a walk or going for a run or whatever it is you do while you listen to this and you're wondering why is he calling out to all these people, we record live on YouTube at four o'clock on Thursdays and people join us on YouTube and, and then they post things in the chat and we talk to them. It's fun. So we're, we're going to have an existential crisis in a couple of weeks because four o'clock is going to change for us. Because yes. at the end of March, the United Kingdom switches to daylight saving time. Yes, it does. Now, at this point, we probably stick to four o'clock local time, and the rest of the world has to figure out what that means for them. Because some of them are going to move forwards with us, and some yes. of them are going to move backwards away from they us. Are. And some of them are going to move towards us, but will already have moved in the other direction. That's right. Um, the, the USA changes on the first Saturday in March. <laughs> Um, I believe, or is it the second Saturday? Anyway, it's and we change on the last Saturday in March, and I think the rest of Europe does that as well for the most part. Apart from the Navajo uh, Nation, apart which from we've the Navajo talked Nation, about before. Yes, but the Hopi have. Nation, which is an exclave within the Navajo Nation, does observe daylight saving time. Oh, good, great. but there's this one guy within the Hopi Nation who doesn't. <laughs> he's, he's, he's a micro state, and he's like, yes. no, he, what, no, it's just some, some dude who's forgotten to move his watch. You yes, know. he doesn't. Know, he's, he doesn't um, know how to change the time on the VCR. Um, but, uh, but yes, that meant I almost missed the Starship launch today, though, because they've changed what central time means and so <laughs> i nearly was an hour late to the starship launch uh, but i wasn't in, and i watched it and it was awesome in 2020 i kept getting invited to things and people would be like yes it is 4 p.m eest and i would say to people what does the s stand for and they were 50 50 between its eastern european standard time and eastern european summer time and those are not yes. the same time zone they That's, are an hour apart they are an hour apart but, uh, Anyway, so I, I have a Cortana key yes, on my keyboard, your Cortana key. Um, which I can remap to something because it's a keychron, so it's all reprogrammable. But Cortana doesn't exist anymore. So I have a physical key that when I press it, brings up a dialog box that says, this is not a thing a- anymore, sorry. And, you know, the whole, like, Microsoft recently announced they were going to start putting co-pilot keys on everything. Yes. And uh, I, I posted this on X, formerly Twitter. And a whole bunch of people were like, yeah, check this out. Like, I've got I've got branded buttons on my television remote control for streaming services that only lasted six months. And <laughs> you know, this sort of this this disparity between we have a third Daniel in the chat now. Oh no, we don't, it's it's second Daniel. It's no, fine. It's, yep, still two um, Daniels. But Brazil dropped daylight saving time in 2017. So uh, uh, yeah. Um, but cool. yes. So can you not remap the Cortana key to launch Copilot? I don't know what launching copilot means. Like, no, the, the, neither like, do I, but I have a Windows 11 laptop. My framework runs Windows 11, and I recently like installed a Windows update, and it went, You've got copilot now. And I sort of I poked it and, and went, Can I ask it questions? And it answers questions and it cites its references, which is sort of impressive. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I have yet to, with all of the excitement about machine learning and language models, the, you know, the point where they are just pervasively helpful, as opposed to being something that you have to start. That'd be kind of nice, you know? I was talking to some folks last night about um, the, uh, the, one of the the headaches, the perennial headaches that I have with modern technology is that people send me a message and I see it when I'm out. And, you know, I get a notification, I'm like, oh, someone wants to talk about that. And then later I'm like, where 
did that notification come from? <laughs> and, you know, maybe it was a, a, a meetup direct message, or maybe it was a LinkedIn or a Twitter or a Telegram or a this or a that or a WhatsApp or a Signal or a Discord. Or a, and there is no tool that I can use anywhere. Like, I can't go on Google and say, can you search all the messages that I got and, and tell me if I missed anything? Yes. Um, this is so, uh, this is why I'm looking forward to. Uh, so I'm on like a pre-order mailing list for mm. something called Claude GPT. I think it is. My, mm. Or is it Clark GPT? Clark GPT. Why am I uh, thinking of a yellow box? I don't know. Was there someone uh, who's going to sell a home appliance that was shaped like a yellow box or something? Almost certainly. Yeah. But so Clark GPT is effectively they're trying to get a GPT model. Mm that will run on something like a Raspberry Pi. Yeah. Which you can then just have in the room yeah. and attach the microphone thing to it. And it processes everything locally. And my hope is that it's something like Home Assistant where you can mm. get plugins and extensions for it. And then I could give that access to WhatsApp or Signal or email or whatever it is and be safe in the knowledge that it was not going to sell all that data to Google yeah. or scrape it and sell it to data brokers and that sort of thing. And so it can, and also it can just be listening all the time. Yeah. So you don't even have to say, hey, Clark, or something. It can just be listening. And then it will be like Jarvis. It will be like Jarvis in Iron Man. Yeah. And you will walk into a room and it will go, hey, I mean, actually, for me, it would be very useful because I could be in the living room, and if I've got one in the living room and one in the kitchen, then while I'm in the living room, I can say, hey, when I get to the kitchen, remind me that I went in there to make a cup of coffee, and then when I've walked down the hall to the kitchen and I'm standing there wondering what the hell I'm doing there and why I came in in the first place because I am old, and Clark will just go, yeah, you were going to make a cup of coffee. So I, I was um, chatting to some folks earlier this week, who I shan't name because of the slightly delicate nature of the conversation, about why is there not a feature that when you go to the toilet, it pops up and goes, remember that yesterday you had a charcoal and beetroot smoothie. Because if you've ever eaten a charcoal and beetroot smoothie, the uh, next day, the output <laughs> will make you think you're dying of something that's going to get published in a medical journal. It yes. is quite horrific. And there is always a moment of... Oh my! Well, and then you're like, no, hang on. I went to that juice bar. Yes. Ah, oh, it's all right. I'm gonna be fine. And you're like, Google knows that. <laughs> Google knows where you are to within yes. enough precision that it knows you're in your bathroom right now, and it knows that you were in a juice bar yesterday, and it probably knows what you bought and how much you paid for it. Um, and you probably took a picture of it and insta'd it. And <laughs> but no, 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 no. They're, they're instead trying to replace software developers. Yes. Um, so here's a question, just you know, for folks listening in. I just want you to think about this for a second. Think about every person in the course of your career. If you're a professional developer or a you know web designer, you've ever wrote code for money. Think about the person who paid you, and can you imagine that person using a like a AI prompt instead of talking to you to get that work done? And when that code had been written, would they have had the faintest idea what to do with it? Or whether it was right. You know, this whole, uh, you know, things, be, now that the whole Devin thing going, oh, it fixed all these problems on, on uh, GitHub. And all right, fine, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I still, I remain resolutely unconvinced. I think that, that AI is going to fundamentally change the craft of software development, but I think that's because it is going to be a useful set of tools for the people who already know how to design software, talk about software, figure out whether yeah. software is even the right answer. The actual writing bit of software is like, that's the part every professional developer I know would do for free. Yes. If they had universal basic income <laughs> and everyone had enough money, all of us would just be like, no, I'm just going to write programs that are cool. I'm going to write code because it's fun. Yeah, I don't care. That's it. If, if, I, it if I won the lottery, problem. I would yeah. sit here all day and do yeah. things like the one billion row challenge and stuff because I've been playing with that. And uh, yeah, and Fret Badger and things that I have in my head that I would build, except I don't have the time. Yeah. Because so, we yes. use our time effectively doing podcasts. 
podcasts. Tell us about the Billion yeah. Row Challenge, which I'd never heard of until you so, popped up on, on social media this week. And I was like, that looks cool. Yeah. Um, so I'm uh, revising and, and reworking my two-day highperformance.net workshop, which I'm doing at NDC Oslo is the next one. Uh, and I'm also working on a, a video course for, a, for an online uh, thing um, on the same subject. And I found this one billion row challenge, which started out in the Java world. And this guy went, OK, you've got a, a text file, UTF-8 text file, and it has one billion rows in it. And each row is the name of a weather station and then a semicolon and then a uh, temperature reading to three decimal places, which obviously can be positive or negative. And the challenge is write a program to run through the entire file and calculate the minimum, maximum, and mean temperatures for each weather station. There's about 420 different weather stations. Mm -hmm. And it's a matter of how fast can you do that. And so, uh, and the Java people with some really hairy tricks, like something that looks like the fast inverse square thing that John Carmack used for Quake yeah. um, to, to pass the float part of a, a byte pointer. Uh, but yeah, um, Java people have managed to get this down to one and a half seconds. Challenge uh, accepted. Challenge accepted. You sort of think, I should be able to do that faster. Mm. And so you start with the naive implementation, which is a, a stream reader, which reads a string at a time, and then calls split on the semicolon, and then uses the first part of that, the returned array as the key, and calls float.pass on the second mm. part of it, and, and so on and so on and so on. That takes about two minutes and 10 seconds on yeah. my workstation, which is an AMD Ryzen 5950X with 16 cores, and it's got 64 gigs of RAM. So I could actually load the entire file into memory if yep. I wanted to, but you have to support not doing that. Yep. Um, and so, yes, and now I've gone down a rabbit hole of memory mapped files, multi-threading, uh, raw pointers and wrapping spans of read-only spans of byte around raw pointers and processing them and using work stealing uh, algorithms over 16 threads and what was the other the last thing uh that i've oh and instead of passing the floats as floats and then doing the min max and mean with those or addition and everything you ignore the decimal point because one of the uh, constraints of the specification mm. is that there will always be three decimal places even if it's a round number it will have point zero 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 so you yeah. can just go they are all there so then instead of turning them into floats turn them into a long yeah and then at the point of output divide by a thousand that yeah. takes about two tenths of a second off the overall runtime, and means I am now down to two point three seconds. And you're trying to and get it below a second and a half. The thing is, at this point, there's one more place that I've got to go, uh, and then it's like, okay, I will accept pull requests if anyone can make this faster. Um, and the only place I have to go is. I am wrapping this read-only span. So you can create a read-only span of byte by mm -hmm. passing in a pointer to a byte and the length. Yeah. Um, and so I do that. And span is essentially, it's an abstraction over memory. Yeah. But it is an abstraction. And that means that I'm pretty sure there's a cost. And so my next bit of fun tomorrow morning is just using the pointer just mm. not using span at all just using the pointer and doing pointer arithmetic and and that sort of thing and we'll see what that does um and then because actually what the challenge times is not uh so my timer is based on uh the app loads and mm. then it does a stopwatch.start new, and then it runs the algorithm, and then it does a stopwatch.stop. But what they're timing is 
running it from the command line using the Unix time command, I think. Yep. And uh, so for that, I need to compile it using native AOT, so it starts up immediately. Uh, but that is going to lose me a lot of the tiered optimizations that I'm getting. So what I actually need to do is run the .NET PGO command line tool to mm. collect uh, a trace that can then be used for profile guided optimization while building the native AOT application so that any optimizations that were done by the tiered compilation when it was running in JIT mode will be applied yeah. to the native code at the point of compilation. So yeah, there's about eight blog posts in this in total. <laughs> it's definitely going to get me blogging again, writing all this stuff up. <clears throat> so uh, you're talking about um, the, the billion row challenge and this whole sort of slightly competitive element. Uh, mm. There's a thing called code golf. And yes. code golf generally is solving a given problem using the smallest number of characters in a given yes. language. Like, can you do Fibonacci and 28 characters of Perl or something? And uh, as some folks watching and listening may recall, I, I once invented a programming language uh, as a joke that then got implemented and became a real thing. Multiple and, times. Uh, at, at the weekend, somebody uh, decided to add Rockstar to Code Golf, which is a. <laughs> if you were going to choose the worst language in the entire world that has ever been invented to try to solve problems using a small number of characters, you would choose Rockstar, which is a language designed to let you write long, loquacious programs that don't use arithmetic operators because you can't sing them and that kind of thing. <laughs> um, Yes. But uh, the, the yeah. interest so code.golf is the site that runs this. And it's actually, you know, that setup on that is is really interesting because um, they have interpreters for all these things, but it's all secret. So you can't hmm. see what anyone else has done. You can just see that they did it in less code than you. So there's this sort of, because uh, there's a code golf stack exchange, which is open and is very collaborative. Yes. But code.golf is very competitive. Competitive. Um, and I, I dropped in on their, their Discord to sort of say hello and and, uh, and see what they were doing with it. Um, and it, it's quite entertaining. You know, some of them are clearly like finding the whole thing very frustrating. And it's like, if it's not fun, why are you doing it? On the other hand, it's like I've been there. I have I have banged my head against the wall using the wrong tools to solve a pointless problem. Um, I have nerd sniped myself on more than one occasion, but it it does. You know, it's always interesting when you you've created something like that to see a fresh set of eyes looking on it from a fresh perspective, and you know, see is there anything in here? Because a lot of it is like can we have this operator does it have modulus and it's like well kind of that's not the point um, no. it, it's not although i yeah. i i'm looking at the fizzbuzz implementation in rockstar on code yeah. golf i'll put the link in the chat so if people want to go and see it there we go um right and so rockstar the way you write numbers is by using words that have the number of characters in the so like yeah. if you're doing 42 then you could write so shut up the the link that you've just shared takes you to the so that is not the implementation you can't see any of the answers on codegolf.com they are all secret that is just their like quick aid memoir on how the Rockstar right, language okay. works. Because so that, to, get that a, doesn't do Fibonacci. to get a zero in um, Rockstar, because it's yeah. the length of the word <laughs> modulus 10, Yeah, you have to use a 10-character word. So you don't have zero. to. You know, one, one of the things about Rockstar is that it started out, at, fundamentally, it's a relatively simplistic um, language in the vein of Perl or JavaScript or something that then yeah. adds aliases. It doesn't... Uh, so there are languages like Pete which have a dramatically different computational model to anything you've ever seen. You know, Pete has a two-dimensional instruction pointer that moves around a colored GIF, and when it crosses from one color to another, that's an instruction. Um, Rockstar is, is, you know, when it, it 
sort of first when I first published the joke spec, um, people built transpilers for it that almost just did a search and replace into Python and most of it worked. Yeah. So it, it doesn't computationally do anything terribly, terribly dramatic. Um, you can use numeric literals if you want to. The whole point is that you don't have to. Um, you know, the, 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 the North Star, the sort of guiding principle of Rockstar is to be able to write a computer program that looks so much like a song that people can look at it and not realize it's a computer program because it has verses and a chorus and it rhymes and <laughs> it, you know, um, and it's kind of achieved that. But uh, I, I have a, I'm starting to pull together a list of things that Rockstar version two should do because uh, it has way out. I thought it would be funny for 72 hours, and it's coming yes. up on six years, and people are still using it. I think it's compiled uh, to WebAssembly. Well, this is exactly what I'm. I'm not compiled to WebAssembly. What I'm. I'm planning to do. Um, so and I'm going to target LLVM. I'm going to stream all of this on Twitch because why the hell not? If you have no idea what you're doing, the best thing to do is do it in public where the whole internet mm -hmm. can laugh at you from the comfort of their own basement. Um, is I'm going to build the, the Rockstar interpreter, so the grammar, the parser, all that kind of stuff in .NET because I love C Sharp and there's a library called Pegasus that does parsing expression grammars. Um, but I want to create an interpreter for it which can then be packaged to run on WebAssembly so you can stick it in a browser. Because yes. what I never wanted to do was pay money to run a server that runs other people's Rockstar programs. Because you don't ever want to do anything that if it's really successful, you'll go bankrupt. Yeah. That, that is kind of rule one of, of so, how to not go broke on the uh, internet. You know, what you basically need to do is yeah. write your Rockstar interpreter in C Sharp in a class library and then just wrap it in a very simple Blazor yeah. WebAssembly app and exactly host it on that. Netlify. Um, but the other thing that I'm I'm really interested in doing because I think it would make it a genuinely interesting learning tool for people studying you know compiler theory and and stuff is to have a mode where it shows you the abstract syntax tree live as you type. And so as you move things around, you can see what that does to the interpreted structure of the program that is then going to get fed into the the interpreter that actually gives you gives you the results. Um, which I think would be fun because uh, the ASTs are cool. ASTs are a wonderful way of visualizing what oh, I moved that and it didn't do what I expected. And you look at the <laughs> ASTs, you're like, oh, I see. And particularly, you know, Rockstar doesn't have like uh, parentheses for operator precedence overriding and stuff. Yes. Um, yeah. And so the syntax tree is often the only way to figure out what some what, is it being added and then multiplied and then concatenated or what. So uh, yes. Yeah, so that'll be so, fun. And also at the moment, there are two kind of leading implementations. There's the the one on the Rockstar, codewithrockstar.com, which is called uh, Satriani, because it's JS, because it's in JavaScript. Um, and there's a Java implementation called Rocky, which is open source, and that's the one that's running on Code Golf. Um, and, and Rocky has an interesting weird. feature that if you want to, you can punch through Rockstar and run native Java in it. <laughs> which uh, some of, some of the, the, the code golfers have been doing to solve the problems on it, and so it's like I'm, I'm Rockstar basically. I'm I'm torn between the sort of no, that's not the idea, and yeah, but the idea is stupid, so I'm not going <laughs> to get involved. Yes, but uh, no, it it it's just it's interesting seeing these little spikes of activity around it that pop out of the woodwork every once in a while. And I think they have happened enough now that it deserves a, a version two and probably a couple of improvements to the docs to yes. make it a bit yeah. easier to figure out what's going on. Um, so <laughs> speaking of Blazor, yes, because we are, um, I am. The other thing I'm working on this week is uh, I'm converting my ASP.NET Core MVC uh, application, mm. uh, my fret badger application which is for guitarists and bass players and ukulele players not banjo players yet but it probably will be um and i'm changing it over so it's a sort of dotnet 8 uh blazer but with server-side rendering mm. and then uh, once it's downloaded all the wasm files it becomes interactive and just runs locally as an app so blazer with server-side rendering isn't blazer well, Blazor with server side rendering is Razor components. It is Razor components. This is until, from the, 
the division that because yes. I, I have a whole chunk about this in my web development workshop, which I will also be running at NDC Oslo in, in June, um, which is basically all the stuff that comes in the box with ASP.net. Yeah. And uh, one of the interesting things that I've been sort of figuring out because the docs are like, it works, and you're like, kind of works, but let's see how it does work. <laughs> um, the, the model that exists now in, in ASP.net, which is really quite powerful, is you can write one set of code and then decide later if you want to run that on your server and send the resulting output to the client yeah. in a sort of you know single page application with postbacks and polling and web sockets and all that kind of stuff which works brilliantly or you can compile the whole thing to WebAssembly and ship it all to the client or you can do both because yes. you can have a thing where when you hit a website it kind of runs it over the wire using HTTP WebSockets until it's downloaded the WebAssembly version. But yeah. there are some weird differences because the .NET runtime, so one of the few things that the .NET runtime does inconsistently cross-platform is localization because yeah. it tends to delegate, you know, this age-old problem of consistency. Um, so there used to be a thing uh, on Windows, Microsoft Windows, applications should look like all the other Windows applications. And, you know, I remember one of the things about Visual Basic that was really exciting is you could write programs that looked like real ones. Yes. And they had gray buttons just like the ones you bought in the shop. <laughs> um, and so, you know, and you wouldn't try and sell an application on Windows. And on Mac OS, they look like Mac OS. And on uh, Unix or Solaris, they look like Solaris. And then, you know, cross-platform libraries. So now something like VS Code kind of is a hybrid between the two. It uses some native elements and some cross-platform elements. And there are toolkits which uh, always seem like if you buy really cheap hardware, like cheap webcams from Amazon, they always come with a driver that appears to have been built from scratch. Like the installer routine uses a GUI toolkit to draw its buttons that you've never seen any other program that looks like that. <laughs> um, but as you know, you have this whole this whole thing with consistency, and now there's this lovely idea. Like, let's we can write our programs in C sharp, which you know, or F sharp, I guess, or Visual yeah. Basic .NET, if that's your jam. If you really and want to, you can compile one version to run on your server, another version to run on WebAssembly, and then just choose based on, hey, how good's the internet connection for that person right now? Which one of those they're going to run? Um, yeah. But then when it gets to things like localization, time zone databases, currency formatting, that kind of thing, um, Linux has a different set of conventions to Windows, which has different conventions to Mac OS, which has different conventions to WebAssembly. So effectively, <laughs> we now have a fourth runtime, yeah. and WebAssembly doesn't know how to format Norwegian Krona properly. And so if you have a localized price list that you're using hybrid rendering on, the one that comes back from the server all looks really nice. And it's got the right spacing and currency formatting. But then after half a second, the web assembly kind of slaps down over the top of it. And everything just goes, ah, we don't actually know this. So we're just going to write knock at the beginning and that will be fine. Uh -huh. uh, it's the same euros. It's the same with uh, Danish Krona. Um, because the, the scenario that I use in my workshop is buying concert tickets for different concert venues around Europe to get very quickly to time zones and currency localization. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, but, uh, to, to technically my understanding is that blazer is the thing that compiles .NET to web assembly. But if you are running Razor components on your server and using WebSockets to send it backwards and forwards, that's not actually Blazor because there's no WebAssembly I'm not involved. Not actually doing that because there's no WebSockets involved. So it is it's using Razor components. And the key yeah. thing with this whole Blazor United or Blazor Everywhere or whatever they ended up calling it is that you can use the same Razor components to render a page statically, yeah. just as yeah. HTML, and just, yeah. there you go, as you are using in the WebAssembly app to do things. And so you can write everything once, and it works both as server-side rendering static files, which go out over HTTP and get cached by Cloudflare and all that good stuff. Yeah. But then as soon as it's finished downloading the, the WASM file, which has got the ahead of time compiled thing in it, then it switches over and becomes interactive. And then when you're navigating around, it's not making requests to the server anymore because it's downloaded the whole of music, which is not actually that much. Um, and it's, it's just ready to go. Yeah. 
because uh, this thing is running and it's costing me $150 a month to run it in railway. Mm. And what I seem to be paying the most money for is egress. Yeah. Um, and the reason I'm paying for egress is because I've got a 40,000 line site map and Google scrapes it frequently. Why not just put Cloudflare in front of it? I have put Cloudflare in front of it. And I and? actually have my Cloudflare cache analytics up on yes. the screen here. I, I won't share it or anything. Um, but yes, uh, so uh, where are we? Because Cloudflare, had... folks, folks who haven't worked with it, basically um, has a massive content delivery network. And it's very easy to say, put Cloudflare in front of my website and basically don't bother me if you've seen something before. Yeah. Um, so in the last 24 hours, I have had a total of 131,000 requests, Yeah, of which 11,000 have been served by Cloudflare and 120,000 have been served by The Origin. And I don't know why. How often does the data uh, change? It, it doesn't. It, it doesn't. I, I, it changes when I update, when I sort of release an updated version. So anyway, yeah, my, I have a plan. To yeah. get around this, and yeah. I have a sh I have a slide with the plan on it and everything. <laughs> I, this this is just ridiculous. Where are we? There we go. I'm going to share that, and it's going to go there. Right. So yes, for those um, of you watching on stereo, Mark is showing a slide containing five rectangles. Yes. Yes. Um, and he's now holding a Raspberry Pi five eight gigabyte. Yep. <laughs> up with a camera and it's refusing to float focus on it. So that cost me what fifty quid. Yeah. Um, Pi five is brilliant, isn't it? It's a wonderful are. piece of it's kit. Insane. And yeah. then I've got this, which is an NVMe SSD um, attacher for it, so I can install the operating system onto uh, the SSD that's currently busy having stuff copied off it, um, and then. Uh, I can use a Cloudflare tunnel. So a Cloudflare tunnel is a daemon process that mm -hmm. runs on your machine yep. and connects, makes an outgoing connection to Cloudflare. So you don't have to worry about DNS or uh, or any of that kind of thing, um, or internal sort of routing in your house and saying when you get a request on this port, send it to that IP address. And all. It, it just works. And the really cool thing is it's available as a Kubernetes container, which makes it work as an ingress controller in Kubernetes. Yeah. And then all I have to do is run Fret Badger in oh, I, I, just Kubernetes. For the record, when I said, yeah, there, what I was doing is going, I have no idea what you just said. Right. So I don't the know ingress about Kubernetes. Okay. So and Kubernetes, I'm still solvent and employable. <laughs> Kubernetes has an uh, has this idea of an ingress controller, which is yep. essentially like the uh, the proxy, the reverse yep. proxy for the entire cluster. Kubernetes so, is container orchestration, right? You've got yes, a bunch of, right. of images yeah. that run, and Kubernetes yes. figures out how they talk to each other and how the world talks to them. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, and so, yeah, uh, the Cloudflare tunnel pod works as the ingress controller, and then I just need to put a couple of attributes on the Fret Badger pod to say, hey, register yourself with the Cloudflare tunnel as this domain, and then it'll get those things routed through properly. And uh, yeah, so I can run that on, I'll probably use K0S, uh, the very lightweight Kubernetes distribution that's designed for things like Raspberry Pis. And What's K0S short for? It's... Because if like there's no letters between the K and the S, S it's longer it's, than KS. It's just... <laughs> um, <clears throat> but yes. And so, and then the only other thing I need is because my internet does go down every now and then. Hmm. And it does, when it goes down, it can be down for multiple hours. And I don't want Fret Badger to be offline while it's doing that. And so I will also publish Fret Badger into an Azure container app, but with the scaling set to as low as zero. And so most of the time, I will not be paying mm. for the Azure container app. But if my internet goes down, the Cloudflare load balancer will fail over 
to the Azure Container app, which will then wake up. And I'm so I have, that, that I have run literally million pound businesses with less failover than you've got for the website that tells you how to play an F sharp minor on a banjo. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm just, I was very influenced by the social network and we don't crash ever. Yeah. Which isn't true anyway. Actually, Stripe oh, just published, uh, Stripe publish a letter every year, like a sort of five, six page PDF about sort of the state of their engineering. So Stripe is a big online credit card company who, uh, they processed over a trillion dollars in online transactions last year. And this one really interesting little detail that stuck out is that they're, their worst outage in the last year, the biggest affected customer had 49 failed payments. Wow. And that was their most significant engineering hiccup. <laughs> and, you know, full post-mortem analysis and everything, what went wrong? How could we allow this to happen? And they're doing like 400 deployments a day. And they have, uh, I think I read, they have a cluster of half a million CPUs that runs their test suite. So they have 500,000 CPU cores running their 1.6 million tests 400 times a day. Wow. Um, which is amazing. But, you know, I've integrated with Stripe on a bunch of different projects, and they are one of those companies. I'm like, I really enjoy working with them as a yeah. developer. Because, yeah. you know, one, they the boundary is in exactly the right place for me between the stuff that I want control over and the stuff that I do not want to touch, own, or be responsible for. Yes. Um, I don't want their credit card number. Yeah, I, I don't want, want credit card numbers. Money. I don't want payments. I don't want to remember it. I, but I, I want my customers to have all of that. Or I yes. want my customers' customers to have all of that. But I don't want to build it for them. <laughs> and yes. uh, so, yeah, and I, that was interesting reading. I, I found that quite entertaining. So uh, Yeah. So apparently um, Google Gemini, formerly Google Bard, won't show C++ to children. Yes, no. C plus plus is is unsuitable for minors. And I, um, I'm I, I saw this story, and one you know this means that those children are therefore unsuitable for cyber engineering jobs in America, yep. because the White House has said that C plus plus is bad for you. If I, <laughs> I, I I'm paraphrasing <laughs> here, but they basically said, man, and I'm like, I don't think C plus plus was the only problem. It may have been one of the many problems. Um, yeah. But yeah, some, somebody shared the screenshot of, of Google Gemini going, yeah, the answer to your problem is in C++, and because you're a minor, I can't show it to you because it's dangerous. <laughs> and, you know, what, I, what I'm worried about is that, like, do, do you remember, like, having at some point in your life, I assume, been a human child? If somebody told you you weren't allowed to see something, what would be the first thing you did? Let's try and see it yeah, using any means necessary. Generation of kids who are going to be jumping on their their hoverboards and bombing it down to the local library to get a copy of Bjarne Straustrup C plus plus book because <laughs> they want to know what's in it, and they are going to be really so good. disappointed when they discover that it's iostream.h and the standard templating library. You know, my favorite thing about all of this, though, and like the the White House saying C plus plus is unsafe and and everything else, is we've been trundling along as a as a civilization and as an mm -hmm. industry since 1972. Yeah, essentially using C. Yeah, um, C plus plus is still really just a pre compiler for C. Uh, just the same as it always was. And so that's, what, 50, 50 years yeah. we've been using C and C++ to solve problems. And then Mozilla come along with Rust and say, hey, you know all those uh, memory errors and pointer errors and, uh, and oh, buffer overruns and everything else that, that happen in C and C++? Here's a programming language where those things are technically impossible or theoretically Ooh. impossible. Yeah. And just by existing, it started this conversation about whether we should be using C++ for things like OpenSSL or web servers or, you know, in any mission critical stuff. Yeah. Because, but only because there is an alternative. Yeah. If there wasn't an alternative, we wouldn't be having that conversation. And so even if Rust, I mean, Rust's doing pretty well for a new language. Yeah. Microsoft are rewriting a bunch of stuff in it. It's in the Linux kernel. Google use it. 
um, and they didn't invent it, and that's like huge. Yeah, and yeah. So, but even if Rust doesn't achieve that kind of mainstream success, even if something else comes along like Zig or V or one of the other languages that has these memory safety guarantees, uh, Rust has created this new paradigm where we can say there must be a safe language because before there were not safe languages or there were but yeah. they were garbage collected yeah. and you couldn't use them for systems programming and so i love that that's happened i think that's great and, and, and it's also you know one of the, you know, one of the mad props I, to mozilla for for achieving that one of the things i find encouraging about rust and sort of to us to, to a small extent go as well is that there is a you know a voice in the industry going we are not just going to sit here and wait for Moore's law to catch up yeah. um however fast the computer is it is still going to be slower than it could be as long as you persist in using you know type checked languages with garbage collection and all that kind of stuff yeah. and wouldn't it be lovely if we could run a thread ripper cpu absolutely flat out with the safety off and not have to worry about did we free all of our mallocs Yes, and uh, yeah, I like that. I've never used Rust. It's one of those uh, the, those languages that I'm sort of aware of, and I think have looked up how to do Hello World in it. But right. at this point, yes. it, it to the best of my knowledge, it doesn't solve any problems that I have. So I so, have, yeah, co I've I've actually made a thing that worked in Rust. Um, it was uh, a telemetry. Well, it was mm. an influx DB yeah. um, proxy, uh, and it just opened you know, HTTP. Uh, it was using Tokyo, and what did I? I think I used Hyper. Mm. And yeah, the influx DB protocol is just lines with metrics and timestamps and everything else on them. And so this, it got the rows that were coming in and then based on values within the rows it partitioned them off to multiple sort of actual influx db instances and uh, i i had started writing it and then went i really want async and await and things so i mm. shelved it until they had written they'd added those to the language and then i finished it off and actually it was an awful lot easier once they had async and await in place um and yeah it was it was fun and it wasn't that difficult. And I've said this before, I say it sort of in my worst programming language talk and yeah. all those sorts of things. I love the Rust compiler. It's the mm. friendliest compiler that there has ever been because, well, that I've used. Because when you make a mistake, it doesn't just go Meh, and try again. It actually shows you the like the segment of code mm. where the problem is, and it tells you what you've done wrong. Then it explains why you can't do it, and then it suggests probable solutions involving like ref objects or mutex objects, or um, you know, change this to be borrowed or or whatever it is. It's lovely. It's like it's giving you a hug and saying, "There, there, you tried." It's not your fault. You're rubbish. Uh, so yes, it's it is it's a nice language to work with. Mm. But there are things that you want to do that you can't do because Rust won't let you because it's not safe. And actually, it's right, and you shouldn't be doing those things. So yeah. stop it. I think is is the essential uh point there but uh but no it is fun and now there's actually a proper ide dedicated to rust um from is it by JetBrains? JetBrains? it oh. is by JetBrains. who else would we it love be? JetBrains. so for a long time if you wanted you could do rust in a JetBrains ide but you had to use um c lion mm. which is their c and c plus plus and then there was a rust plugin but they now have although for it's... folks who want to google c lion it's c as in the letter c as in the programming language and lion as in gur simba and mufasa and all that kind of stuff so yes, i've, I've yeah. lost it it's not showing up in my JetBrains toolbox anymore i've got goland installed all of... oh no there it is rust rover so yes they are doing rust rover a dedicated ide for the rust development Powerful yeah. refactorings, thorough code analysis, and lots of integrations for web version control databases and more. So yeah, I will 
probably grab that at some point. But like I say, I've just had to install GoLand because I've got to write some Go code. Oh, what's the Go yeah. code doing? Uh, it's something for Honeycomb uh -huh. to do with Open Telemetry and the Hotel Collector. So, yeah, I'll, I'll probably be talking about that next week. Cool. Yes. And yes, Origami Marie in the chat. Um, so, Unlike GCC, which actively thinks you should go read the manual and think about how it is that all the code between the mistake and the error is technically correct. Yes. I, I, I love that turn of phrase, the code between the mistake and the error. Yes. It's like <laughs> you, you miss a semicolon on line 28 and the compiler happily gets to line 5,942 and then goes, yeah, you've missed a semicolon somewhere. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, Oh, that's that. That's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. But no, GCC. Also, it, it is makes. Not I, I love. I love point. semantics. I love. I love specific language. And because to most people who speak English, a mistake and an error are the same thing. Yeah. But in programming, they are not. No. The mistake, the mistake is what you got wrong that caused yeah. the error, and the error is your program actually crashing. Yes. And those two things can be galaxies apart yes the the, the mistake is for want of a nail and the error is the kingdom was lost exactly if you're familiar with that bit of doggerel yes so um so yeah, yeah. so we had um you were talking there about uh you know rust not letting you do unsafe things um we had james bender at london.net last night um oh, yeah. so james is a, he's a really interesting guy he uh used to be .NET, and he actually wrote a book about test-driven development in .NET about 10, mm -hmm. 12 years ago, um, yeah. which he did plug last night, and he said, this is my book, I wrote it, don't buy it unless you need something to prop the door open, or it's Mother's Day, because my mum thought it was really nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, tech moves fast. There is... Yes. Uh, uh, the charity shops and libraries around where I live have notices up saying, we don't take computer books unless they are for the actual current version of the software they are yeah. about, which yeah. is quite a nice guidance. Um, but he was talking about Tailwind. And right. uh, so Tailwind is a, a CSS thing, which I have... I have seen, like I've, I've looked at little snippets of Tailwind code and gone, ah, that just looks like somebody has invented a set of aliases because they don't want to write CSS by hand. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I had this thing, which I think is familiar to a lot of people who are exposed to a lot of technology of being simultaneously, I probably have not seen and understood the full picture here with that looks really boring and not something I need in my life. Yes. Which you can quite happily, you know, keep those for me. I think I'm up to two years of tailwind going, I should look into this, but it doesn't look exciting enough to. Um, yeah. But uh, no, it turns out I was I was absolutely right and that I was absolutely wrong. And okay. one of the very nice things that Tailwind does is it does uh, tree shaking. So you can restrict your developers to, or your team, to the set of classes and colors and styles that are in your client style guide. And that's the only ones they can use, which I think is a lovely way of creating a sort of pit of success for, it means the only styles you have available, the ones that the client is going to go, yeah, that looks like our stuff. That's fine. That's good. Which I, I thought was a really interesting idea. So um, now the slight downside, we yes. recorded the whole thing. I have a little recording and, and microphone set up and I have the Anchorwork 650 microphones, which are fantastic. And one oh, of the yes. features they have, which is brilliant, is they record natively on the mic. So if you have a problem or there's interference or the Wi-Fi drops out or the, the you know the, the wireless signal drops out, um, you can go and pull the audio files off the microphones and we build the clip. I discovered this morning that the video recording from last night had a couple of audio dropouts in it. And about hmm. two minutes later, I discovered that the backup feature only works if you push the record button. Oh. I run everything straight into OBS, so it never occurred to me that I also need to tell the microphones to start recording yeah, what they're doing. Yeah. So, uh, so yes, there is video up on the London, learning experience, the London.net YouTube channel of James' presentation about Tailwind, and it's you know you can see exactly what he's doing and and get all the yeah. gist of it. Um, but yeah, there's a couple of dropouts I, which are entirely my fault because I don't know how to use the shiny toys. I will yet. have to. Well, I I I might watch that because I. Looked at Tailwind, but only yeah. ever so briefly, and I'm sure that people will leave comments on the YouTube video or in the chat or something and explain to me why it is that I am wrong and stupid and should not be allowed near a mouse. 
But to me, it looks like style tags. Yeah. You, you basically, you've got, you pre create a class for every possible style thing that you could want to say. And then you put that class in the class tag instead of just putting the style directly so, into the style tag. The thing about and it, that, that is. That is true apart from every possible. Um, or certainly my understanding after watching watching James' presentation last night is what it, it does. So for example, uh, CSS, you can have any shade of red from zero to 255. Tailwind gives you 10 shades of red, which are the 10 shades that color psychologists have identified as being the ones that to human beings look like a sort of even tempered scale of colors which oh. doesn't mean that they are mathematically unique, like, uh, you know, yeah. equal, that the intervals between them are not equal because there's a response curve in the way the human eye works. And so that, that to me, was kind of, in a nutshell, like, oh, so they take this, they don't just give you red, and they don't give you zero through 255. They yeah. give you red one through red nine, all of which are guaranteed to be good shades of red that will work harmoniously with the other stuff you've got. And so you have, uh, you know, it, it gives you a, a sort of restricted palette of usable tools. So right. you don't get the choice overload of, I, I can do anything, but you also don't get the, there's one red, and if you don't like it, you've got to make up your own. I um, might use that then. It's that certainly, it, it's interesting too. Yeah. Um, it's I got a bunch terrible. of things like, uh, you know, MT4 is like if you don't want to write margin top you can write mt and yeah. i'm like i never really had a problem but then you realize that you know if you if you know exactly how big the margins on your site are or you've done it from external style sheets and stuff then that's fine but inconsistency of margins leads to things that just look kind of cheap and messy and no one can really tell you why unless they're a designer yeah. Um, you know, there's so much uh, effort and research has gone into presentation theory over, uh, you know, I, I have a talk where I talk about typography and, you know, I sort of say at the end, we got basically when you build a web page now, you've got 5,000 years of alphabets and writing, 500 years of printing and layout and graphic design, 50 years of digital technology, and then probably five years of retina displays and e-ink devices, all converging at once. And you've got to figure out how to isolate the most significant elements from those disciplines with you know orders of magnitude difference in how long human beings have been working on them. And uh, yeah, no tail. I mean, I, I I do not agree with Tailwind because I, uh, you know, I sort of adhere to the principle that markup should be minimalist. And if you want your website to look different, you should do it with CSS that targets yeah. the bits of the page. That's, that's you know, always I mean, been my kind of. <clears throat> but I've also seen firsthand how incredibly difficult and expensive it is to maintain that kind of thing when you're working across a team. Because it sounds brilliant. Like, I'll oh, just use an H1 and we'll make sure it looks good. But it's very, very common for somebody to have a specific requirement that isn't one of the ones you anticipated. Yeah. And, you know, the big, like, you know, the bootstraps and the material UIs and stuff, they are like, no, 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 we, we've got a team of people whose job is to think of the problems you might have later and yeah. make sure we've we've covered them. Um, but you know, Tailwind certainly looked like if you got a you know relatively small team, you got a you know strong design brief from a client, and you just want a way of uh, adhering to that brief, which everyone can work with effectively. Yeah, definitely, pretty pretty interesting stuff. I'll so. tell you what, there is one thing that I just found, kind of browsing through the Tailwind site, which I which just noticed a question from it... Origami Marie, and the thing is least distance backup in established phrase. <laughs> What was the context? I completely bounced over least distance backup. Um, yeah, no, I, I, there's now a little bit of latency, and in a moment, another yes. comment will will pop up. Yes, um, and the no. next comment, oh, but to which humans? Um, average humans. There were actually yeah. some very good questions last night about things like accessibility, color blindness, uh, high contrast mm. display, and that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, you know, generally, anything like color psychology when you're building a website. You're like, we'll hit the 80th percentile. We'll yeah. we'll we'll make this usable to the the average person using the best-selling mobile device of the last year, and accept that 
if outliers are a significant demographic in your uh, target group, you are going to have to do a bit of extra work with it. So yeah, but there is one thing that Tailwind have done, which actually makes it more likely that I will use it. Because... Back up on the microphone, least distance back up. Um, so uh, uh, yes, right. about the, I've I've never heard the expression least distance back up before, but yeah, this is a uh, um, literally record on the thing which is making the noise. Yeah. and then have a recording there, which is wireless, so it's from a distance of a couple of feet. And then, I mean, when we do these uh, these uh, StreamYard things for the this, none of this is being recorded locally, is it? It just all goes straight into the cloud, goes to YouTube, and YouTube record it. It does. So, there is an option to record locally. Yep, yeah, it's got beta written on it, so I don't want to click it yeah, in case something it, bad happens. We happened. don't use it. Um, yeah. But yes, no, but Tailwind, because all these designer and CSS and SCSS and SAS and whatever else, um, they're all written in JavaScript and they use Node. But uh, Tailwind, no, no. Tailwind have a standalone command line interface. So one of the things... Single, I think they've done it in Go, but possibly Rust, but it's a native executable. One of the things that I teach in, in my web design with .NET 8 is how to do SAS with no JavaScript. Yes, I uh, I actually say this is you got two days on how to build a website and you will not have a Node modules folder at the end of it. Node JS is not involved anywhere because SAS is written in Dart, and there is a SAS package on NuGet which bundles the Dart executable, so it just builds your SAS for you without having to run Node JS anywhere. Um, it then kind of sucks when you put it in GitHub and you go into Azure and you like deploy that and it says, oh yeah, we use Node JS eighteen to deploy that and you're like. Can, can you not? Can, yes. Is there any way but we can deploy .NET without having to use Node.js somewhere? But yeah. All right. So um, we're up against time. Uh, I'm looking here. Um, I want to talk about this. So there is a thing called PostCom, <laughs> which is the Postman conference. The yeah. tool that you use to yep. make API calls yep. has a conference, yes, which I find strange. But yes. I assume the majority of the conference is going to be about APIs and just tangentially Postman related or something. I, 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 I genuinely have no. I mean, I, I love Postman. I use it, but Postman is full of features I will never use. Yeah, um, I do not use a Postman account. I do not use a Postman team test plan i do not, no. not use postman you know postman i use a send request. testing and yeah. yeah um and it works really well for that and i send a request i get a response and i'm like oh that's nice and and yeah but they um, have a special i mean you know they could have booked the line breakers but they decided to go a different way um and so yeah who have they booked to perform at postcon 2024 six-time grammy winner and multi-platinum recording artist t Payne. T-Pain. T-Pain. So if you are really excited about sending HTTP requests, uh, you can go to PostCon, and uh, it's in San Francisco at the Hilton in Union Square at the end of April, and you get a whole day of workshops about APIs and Postman and stuff, and then in the evening, T-Pain is doing a live show, and they got their own bowling alley, and I, I, yeah. I did not realize that, I mean, Postman is a wonderful tool, and I'm sure the company who build it are excellent people. I hadn't realized there was that much celebratory budget in the HTTP request space. No, that they, was just they clearly have me. too much VC funding or something. Like, <laughs> you know, well, I don't know. Maybe people. maybe like T-Pain is moonlighting, doing a whole bunch of API design and GraphQL and stuff, and is like, yeah, you get me in the workshops for free and I'll yeah. do you a show. Um, the, the, I mean, previously, the, the sort of best band I've seen in that kind of context was I went to the Dev Express party at mm. the Build conference in California uh, 12 years ago because uh, Ben was a baby at the time. And they had Smash Mouth, um, All Star dude, and dude, Walking All -Star. on the Sun and everything from else. Shrek. And the dude from Smash Mouth, who is sadly no longer with us, and may he rest in peace, um, but he did a bunch of, the, you know, did all the songs and then. Uh, while he was doing, or as he was just about to do All Star, he demanded that the bar fill up any shot glasses that they had available with tequila and just came down and started doing shots with the audience. And then it all just went downhill <laughs> from there, really. But it was a brilliant night. Brilliant. 
Um, um, so I do. Yeah, I, I wasn't there, but Niall Rogers was the closing uh, keynote at Uradev in Sweden a few years back. Niall, um, as in chic Niall Rogers. As in chic Niall Rogers. Wow. Because um, Uradev has, has often, like, they've booked a closing keynote who is somebody, like, genuinely famous. The yeah. kind of people yeah. that they book through speaker agency bureaus and stuff. And uh, the the yeah, and they, they've had some interesting people. And, and yeah, Niall Rogers was yeah. there. So I mean, um, if you can get Niall Rogers and T Pain and Smash Mouth to turn up to to technical developer events, then we really need to have a word with Jacob about the Copenhagen Developer Festival. Yeah, we do because yeah. He so I'm, I'm doing a promo for them. I'm going to be in. Uh, so if anyone listening to this is in Copenhagen on uh, the eighth of April, we are doing. Uh, no, 9th of April, the Tuesday, uh, we're doing a community meetup there to uh, promote the Copenhagen Developer Festival, which is going to be coming back in August. So uh, I'm going to be doing a, a talk about uh, tipping points and AI and digital photography and why computers are not going to take your job, but they are quite useful for doing your job. Um, yes. We're going to have a bunch of lightning talks from uh, you know local speakers from various dev communities around Copenhagen. And uh, yeah, that will be fun. Bands performing on actually quite a good music stage with a decent sound system. That so that, that's the, that's the, the dev fest just... pitch. Oh. Yeah. Um, so uh, so I yeah, that, standing in front of that stage last year when the band before us were on, and the bass, it was actually blowing. It was like affecting people's hair and i was kind yeah. of like oh that's going to be really good when we do enterprise waterfall <laughs> <laughs> um, and this year we'll have reply guy as well we will and i'm gonna so I, I have a i have it this is this is my my latest song idea that has popped into my head um is uh i don't know if you know this but morton harkett from aha was mm -hmm. instrumental in the legislation which led Norway to become the world leading market for electric vehicles. I did not know that. I knew that Norway were the world leading country because once you take away the tax, yep. a Model S Tesla yep. costs the same as a BMW 3 Series. So in the late 1980s, um, some guy in Germany converted a Fiat Panda to run on batteries. And it made its way to Norway, and it was purchased by a sort of protesty eco science transport research cooperative, um, which included uh, Morton Harkett and Mags, whose surname I cannot remember, from the band Aha, who would drive it around Oslo. And they would mm. protest because they'd be like, we're not paying to drive here. This car produces no emissions. And it would get yes. impounded. It would get towed away. They would buy it back because no one wanted a electric Fiat Panda. <laughs> and uh, I was reading this story, and my brain started playing The Living Daylights by Aha with the lyrics replaced with, oh, electric Panda. <laughs> and this is how it starts. And it's a fantastic song. And obviously, we are going to be performing in Norway in June at NDC. And yeah, so that is currently riffing around the bit of my brain that does silly stuff. Okay, and, you uh, do that. I will keep working on I've got two. No, three that I'm trying to decide which one to actually focus on. So there's Leech, which yeah. goes to the tune of Creep and is about people who don't support open source projects. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm a leech. I'm a freeloader. Um, and there's... Uh, I'm just a .NET derp bag, <laughs> which I think would be fun. Um, and... Then there's one that's actually, I'm not sure if it's funny or not. I think it probably is funny, but do you know the song Man in the Moon by R.E.M.? Yes. Mot the Hoople and the Game of Life and all that sort of thing. Mm. And it's about uh, Andy Kaufman. Yes. Uh, who was an American comedian and he played Locker on the sitcom Taxi. Mm. And he, I mean, he was a genius. Um, and there's a fantastic film also called Man on the Moon uh, starring Jim Carrey as yes. Andy Kaufman. And it is, it is brilliant. And the film was actually funded by Michael Stipe because he's this huge Andy Kaufman fan. Um, and so I'm, I, I want to take that song, but make it about Alan Turing and AI. Um, so we have once done a song which was not actually funny. 
Um, yes. Because Vagif and I performed at PubCon Fin KCDC on the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landings. Yeah. And uh, so I, I had rewritten Summer of 69 by Brian Adams to be about the moon landings. Um, in a sort of, you know, fairly... The thing is, once you get into something that's like a sort of earnest tribute, in that context, it is very difficult to not end up being cringy. Yeah. And, you know, it's uh, a bunch of people. I've had some free beer. They're there to, you know, laugh and sing along to the choruses and stuff. And I think it's a very delicate balance to get right, to to have a parody which is not a joke. Yes. It's just because um, the, the thing I've got, the, the sort of catchy chorus bit. Mm. Um, the chorus goes, if you believe they put a man on the moon. Mm. Uh, and if it's about Alan Turing and AI, uh, then that can just be, if you believe that there's a man in the room. Because <laughs> that's the Turing test, is that, that if is, you think you're yeah. talking to a real person. And so, yeah, anyway, I'll try it, and I'll send you the lyrics, and you can we can decide whether it's I mean, that, that, or not. That one line to me demonstrates that you can have something where the meaning is sincere, but the wordplay is entertaining. Yes, um, I think so. Yeah, which I, is a, if you can get the balance right. Okay. Anyway, we're going to... So, yeah, we gonna, we are... Because I'm going to go and make macaroni cheese. Stop. You do that. Um, yeah. I had Starship Starship launched today, and it was actually very successful, although they both still exploded. Um, but we can talk more about that next week because they'll have done the post-mortems and we can find out what actually went wrong, and then let's talk about it next week. Excellent. We've done for this week. All right. Thanks for tuning in, folks. It's been a pleasure, as always. You take care of yourselves and each other, and we will see you somewhere on the internet sometime soon. Yeah, bye -bye. take care of yourselves. Bye.